the story is open arms. I have no hatred in me. I'm almost certain of that. I fought for my country long enough to lose my wife to another man, a cripple. This was because even though I was alive, I was dead to her, being far away. Perhaps it bothers me a little that his deformity was something he was born with and not earned in the war. But even that doesn't matter. In the end, my country itself was lost and I'm no longer there and the two of them are surely suffering. From what I read in the papers about life in a unified Vietnam, they mean nothing to me, really. It seems strange even to mention them like this. And it is stranger still to speak of them before I speak of the man who suffered the most complicated feeling I could imagine. It is he who makes me feel sometimes that I am sitting with my legs crossed in an attitude of peace and with an acceptance of all that I have been taught about the suffering that comes from desire. There are others I could hate, but I feel sorry for my enemies and the enemies of my country. I live on South Mary Poppins Drive in Gretna, Luciana, and since I speak perfect English, I'm influential with the others who live here, the West Bank Vietnamese. We are all of us from South Vietnam. If you go across the bridge and into New Orleans, and you can take the interstate north, and then turn on a highway named after a chef, you will come to the place called Varsilis. There you will find the Vietnamese who are originally from the north. They are Catholics in Versailles. I'm a Buddhist, but what I know about things, I learned from a communist one dark evening in the province of Phukotai in the Republic of South Vietnam. I was working as an interpreter for the Australians in their base camp near New Day. The Australians were different from the Americans when they made a camp. The Americans cleared the land, cut it and plowed it and leveled it and strung their barbed wire and put up their tin hutches. The Australians put up tents. They lived under canvas with wooden floors and they didn't cut down the trees. They raised their tents under the trees and you could hear the birds above you when you woke up in the morning. And I could think of home that way. My village was far away, up country near Plaiku, but my wife was still my wife at that time. I could lie in a tent under the trees and think of her and that would last until I was in the mess hall and I was faced with eggs and curried sausages and beans for breakfast. The Australians made a good camp, but I could not understand their food, especially at the start of the day. The morning I met Dang Win Thip, I first saw him across the mess hall staring at a tray full of this food. He had the commanding officer at one elbow and the executive officer at his other. So I knew he was important and I looked at them closely. His skin was dark, basic piece and blood like me and he wore a sports shirt of green and blue plaid. He could be anyone, anybody on a motor scooter in Saigon or hustling for shit fair in Wang To. But I knew there was something special about him right away. His hair was widely fanned on his head, the product of DC field barbering, but there was something else about him that gave him away. He sat between these two Australian officers who were nearly a head taller and he was hunched forward a little bit. But he seemed enormous somehow. The people in our village believe in ghosts. Many people in Vietnam have this belief and sometimes a ghost will appear in human form and then vanish. When that happens and you think back on the encounter, you realize that all along you felt like you were near something enormous, like if you came upon a mountain in the dark and could not see it but knew it was there. I had something of that feeling as I looked up Thip for the first time. Not that I believed he was a ghost, but I knew he was much bigger than the body. He was in as I stared at the curried sausages. Then there was a stir to my left, someone sitting down. But I didn't look right away because Thap held me. You'll have your chance with him, mate, a voice said in a loud whisper. Very near my ear, I turned and it was Captain 
Townsend. The intelligence officer, his moustache waxed and twirled to the two sharp points, twitched as it usually did when he and I were in the midst of an interrogation and he was getting especially interested in what he heard. But it was Thap now causing the twitch. Townsend's eyes had slid away from me and back across the mess hall and I followed his gaze. Another Vietnamese was arriving with a tray. An ARBN major and CO slid over and let the new man sit next to Thap. The major said a few words to Thap and Thap made some sort of answer and the major spoke to CO. He's our new Bushman scout, Townsend said. The major there is heading back to division officer breakfast and then we can talk to him. I'd heard that a new scout was coming in but he would be working mostly with the units out interdicting the infiltration routes, so I hadn't given him much thought. Townsend was fumbling around for something and I glanced over. He was pulling a slip of paper out of his pocket. He read a name of the paper, but he butchered the tones and I had no idea what he was saying. I took the paper from him and read Thap's name. Townsend said, They tell me he's a real smart little bastard. Political cadre, but before that he was a sapper. Brains and a killer too. Hope this converse, conversion of his is for real. I looked up and it was the ARBN major who was doing all the talking. He was in fatigues that was so starched and crispy they could sit there all by themselves and his hair was slicked into careful shape and rose over his forehead in a pompadour the shape of the front fender on the elegant old Sichuan sedans you saw around Saigon. Thap had sat back in his chair now and he was watching the major talk. And if I was the major, I'd feel very really nervous because the man beside him had the mountain shadow and the steady look of the ghost of somebody his grandfather has treated or cook-holded or murdered 50 years ago and he was back to take him. It wasn't until the next day that Captain Townsend dropped Thap's file into the center of my desk. The desk was spread with a dozen photographs, different angles on two dead woodcutters that an Australian patrol had shot yesterday. The woodcutters had been in a restricted area and when they ran, they were killed. The photos were taken after the two had been led out in the cart. Their arms sprawled, their legs angled like they were leaping up and clicking their heels. The fall of Thap's file scattered the photos, fluttered them away. Townsend said, look this over right away, mate. We'll have him here in an hour. The government program that allowed a long time hardcore Viet Cong like Thap to switch sites so easily had a stiff name in Vietnamese, but it came to be known as Open Arms. An hour later, when Thap came through the door with Townsend, he filled the room and looked at me once, knowing everything about me that he wished. And the idea of our opening our arms to him, exposing our chests, our hearts, truly frightened me. In my village, you ran from a ghost because if he wants you, he can reach into that chest of yours and pull out not only your heart but your soul as well. I knew the facts about Thak from the file, but I wondered what he would say about some of these things I just said. The things about his life, about the terrible act that turned him away from the cause he had been fighting for. But Townsend grilled him. Through me, for an hour first, he asked him all the things an intelligence captain would be expected to ask. Even though the file already had the answers to these questions as well, the division interrogation had already learned all that Tarp knew about the locations and strengths of the VC units in our area, the names of shadow government Carter in the villages, things like that. But Tha patiently repeated his answers, smoking one Chesterfield cigarette after another, careful about keeping his ash from falling on the floor, never really looking at either of us, not in the eye, only occasionally at our hands. A quick glance, like he expected us to suddenly be holding a weapon, and he seemed very small now. No less smart and skilled in killing, but a man at last in my eyes. So when Captain Townsend was through, he gave me a nod and as we'd arranged, he stepped out for me to chat with Thap informally. Townsend figured that 
Thap might feel more comfortable talking with his countryman one on one. I had my doubts about that. Still, I was interested in this man, though not for the reasons sounds and words. At that moment, I didn't care about the tactical intelligence my boss wanted, and so even before he was out of the room, I intended to ignore it. But I felt no guilt. He had all they needed already. As soon as the Australian was gone, Thaf lifted his face high for the first time and blew a puff of smoke toward the ceiling. This stopped me cold, like he just sprung an ambush from the undergrowth where he had been crouching very low. He didn't look at me. He watched the smoke rise and he waited. His face placid. Finally, I felt my voice would come out steady, and I said, "We are from the same region. I'm from Telugu province. The file said that Tha was from Kuantum, the next province north, bordering both Cambodia and Laos." He said nothing. Though he lowered his face a little, he looked straight ahead and took another drag on his cigarette, a long one, the ash lengthening visibly, doubling in size as he drew the smoke in. I knew from the file the sadness he was bearing, but I wanted to make him show it to me, speak of it. I knew I should talk with him indirectly, at least for time. But I could not. But I could only think of the crude approach, and to my shame, I took it. I said, "Do you have family there?" His face turned to me now, and I could not draw a breath. I thought for a moment that my first impression of him had been correct. He was a ghost, and this was the moment he would carry me away with him. My breath was gone, never to return, but he did not dissolve into the air. His eyes fixed me, and then they went down to the file on the desk, as if to say that I asked what I already knew. He had been sent to. Fok To Province to indoctrinate the villagers. He was a master. Our other sources said of explaining the communist vision of the world to the woodcutters and fishermen and rice farmers. And meanwhile, in Quantum, the tactics had changed, as they always do. And three months ago, the VC made a lesson out of a little village that had a chief with a taste of American consumer goods and information to trade for them. This time the lesson was severe, and the ones who did not run were all killed. Tap's wife and two children expected to be saved because someone was supposed to know whose family they were. They stayed, and they were murdered by the VC. And Tap made a choice. His eyes were still on the file, and my breath had come back to me. And I said, "Yes, I know." He turned away again, and he stared at the cigarette, watched the curl of smoke without drawing it into him. I said, "But isn't that just the war? I thought you were a believer." I still am," he said, and then he looked at me and smiled faintly. But the smile was only for himself, like he knew what I was thinking, and he did. This is nothing new," he said. "I confessed the same thing at your division headquarters. I believe in government caring for all the people, the poor before the rich. I believe in the state of personal purity that makes this possible." But I finally came to believe that the government, these men from the north, want to set up can't be controlled by the very people it's supposed to serve. And what do you think of these people you've joined to fight with now? I said. He took a last drag on his cigarette and then leaned forward to stub it out in an ashtray at the corner of my desk. He sat back and folded his hands in his lap, and、uh, his face grew still. His smile drew down in placid seriousness. I understand them," he said. "The Americans too. I learn about their history, what they believe is good. I admit that my first impulse at this was to challenge him. He didn't know anything about the history of Western democracy until after he'd left the communists. They killed his wife and his children, and he wanted to get them. But I knew、uh, that what he said was also true. He was a believer. I could see his Buddhist upbringing in him. The communists could appeal to that; they couldn't touch the Catholics. But the Buddhists, who didn't believe in all the mysticism, were well prepared for communism. The communists were full of right views, right intention, right speech, and all that. And Buddha's second truth about the thirst of the passions being the big trap. The communists were real strict about that. Real truths. If a VC got caught by superiors with a pinup, just a girl in a bathing suit, even. He'd been very deep trouble. That thing, Thap said about personal purity, after sank in a little, little bit. 
it pissed me off but this is a weakness of my own i guess though at times i can't quite see it as a weakness i'm not that good at Bud- uh, good a buddhist i live in america and things just don't look the way my mother and my grandmother explained them to me but thap suddenly seemed a little too smug and i wasn't frightened by him anymore he was a communist prude and i even had trouble figuring out how he brought himself to make a couple of kids then to my shame i said do you miss being with your wife do you what i almost said was do you miss sleeping with your wife but i wasn't quite that heartless even with this smug true believer who until very recently had been a bitter enemy of my country changing my question as i did even as i spoke it i thought i would never get the answer to what i really wanted to know as soon as the words were out of my mouth i felt a flush spread from my under my chin and up my face it was only a minor attack of shame until i saw what was happening before me i suppose it was the sudden suddenness of this question its unexpectedness that caught him off guard it's an old interrogation trick but thaps hands rose gently from his lap and i knew they were remembering her it all happened in a few seconds and the hand simply lifted up briefly but i knew without any doubt that his palms his fingertips were stunned by the memory of touching her then the hands returned to his lap and he said in a low voice of course i miss her i asked him no more questions and after he was gone my own hands lying on the desktop grew restless rose and then hid in my lap and burned with their own soft memories i still had a wife and she had not been my wife for long before i had to leave her i knew that thab was no ghost but a man and he loved his wife and desired her as i loved and desired mine and that was within the bounds of his purity he was a man but i wished from then on only to stay far away from him then fantry guys had their own interpreter and i would not have to deal with thab and i was very glad for that less than a week later however i saw him again it was on a sunday early that morning there had been some contact out in the long calm mountains just to the east of us first there was the popping of small arms for a few minutes and then a long roar the mini guns on the cobra says they swooped in and then there was silence in the afternoon the enlisted men played cricket and i sat beneath a tree with my eyes on them but not really following this strange game just feeling the press of the tree shade and listening to the trunk thunk of the ball on the bat and the smattering of applause and i let the breeze bring me a vision of my wife bearing her out die the long silk panels fluttering as i as if lifted by this very breeze as if she was nearby waiting for me and a few times as i sat there i thought of thap maybe it was my wife who brought him to me the link of our yearning hands but it wasn't until the evening that i actually saw him it was in the officers club sometimes they had a film to show and this was one of the nights captain townsend got me there early to help me move the wicker chairs around to face the big bed sheet that put up at one end for a for a screen townsend wouldn't tell me what the film was when i asked him he just winked and said you like it mate and i figured it was another of norman wisdom films this little man wisdom was forever being knocked down and tormented by a world of people bigger than him townsend knew i didn't like these films and so i decided that was what the wink was all about thap came in with a couple of infantry officers and i was sorry to see that the interpreter wasn't with them i could not understand why they had him there here i guess they were trying to make him feel unwelcome a part of their world i still think that they just didn't understand what sort of man he was they clapped him on the back and pointed to the screen and the projector and they tried their own few words of vietnamese with him and some of that baby talk the pidgin english that sounded so ridiculous to me even with english being my second language i didn't think thap would like norman wisdom either thap and i were both little men but when he came in the thing i was most concerned about was the was that since i was the only other vietnamese in the club thap would seek me out for help but he didn't he glanced at me once and that was it the, the, the two infantry officers took him up 
to the front row and sat in between them. And when Thaw was settled, my attention shifted enough that I finally realized that something was going on here out of the ordinary. The Aussies were unusually boisterous, poking at one another and laughing. And one of them yelled to Townsend, You intelligence boys have to smuggle this stuff in. Townsend laughed and said, It was too bloody hot even for us, mate. I didn't know what he was talking about and I was evidently staring at Captain Townsend with my confusion. Clear my face, he looked at me and then put his arm around my shoulders. You will see, he said. It's for all us boys who are missing our little ladies. He nodded me towards the chair and I went and sat a couple of rows behind Thap and the under of his leg. I could see only the back of his head, the spray of his hair, his deep brown neck, the collar of his plaid shirt, he raised his face to the screen and the lights went out and the films began. There were nine of them, each lasting about 20 minutes. The first began without any credits. A man was walking along a country path. He was a large, blonde-haired man, Swedish, I lived alone. Though at the time it simply struck me that this wasn't the sort of man who would be in the Norman Wizard movie. He was dressed in tight blue jeans and a flannel shirt that was unbuttoned. Exposing his bare chest, I had never seen an Englishman dressed like that, or an Australian either. And Wisdom's movie were all in black and white. This was, this one was in grainy color. And the camera was quaking just a little bit. And then I realized that all I was hearing were the sounds of the projector clicking away and the men beginning to laugh. There was no soundtrack on this film. Someone shouted something that I didn't catch. Then someone else. I thought at first that there'd been a mistake. This was the wrong film and the men were telling Townsend to stop the show, put on Little Norman. But then the camera turned to a young woman standing by a fence with cows in the background and she was wearing shorts that were cut high up into her crotch and she shook her long hair and the Australians whooped. The camera turned to the man and he was clearly agitated and the club filled with cries that I could understand now. Go for her mate, put it to her mate, get on with it. I glanced at Thap. And his face was lifted to the screen, but of course, he didn't know what was about to happen. I looked up too, and the man and woman were talking with each other, and they kissed. Not for long, the woman pulled back and knelt down before the man, and she unsnapped and unzipped his blue jeans, and she pulled them down, and he still had his underpants on. I discovered a little to my surprise that I could not breathe very well, and I felt weak in my arms. I had never seen a film like this, the way her... I'd heard things about them. But there was a moment when the man remained clad in his underpants that I thought there was still some boundary here, that this was not a true example of the films I'd heard about. But the woman squeezed at him there, playfully smiling like, this was wonderful fun for her and then she stripped off his underpants. His body was ready for her and that was very clear there. Right on the screen and she seemed truly happy about this and she brought her face near to this part of him and I drew in a sudden breath as she did a thing that I had never even asked my wife to do. Though seeing it now made me weak in my desire for her. And then I looked up, looked at Thap. It was simply a reflex I still had not put together what was happening in this club and what Thap was and what had happened to him in his life and what he believed. I looked to him and his face was still lifted. He was watching and I glanced up and the woman's eyes lifted too. She looked at the men even as she did this for him. And I returned to Thap and now his face was coming down very slowly. His head bowed low and it remained bowed and I watched him for as long as I could. I must admit to my shame that it was not very long. I was distracted, I said before, speaking of Thap's personal purity, that an, in, that an indifference to this notion is a weakness of mine. I had never remarried. And I must admit that it pleases me to look at the pictures in some of the magazines easily available in America. The women are so naked, I feel I know them very well and the looks on their faces are usually so pleasant that they seem somehow willing for me to know them. This way, me personally, it's a childish fantasy, I realize hard, hardly the right intentions and I suppose some day this little desire will lead to unhappiness. But I'm susceptible to that and on that dark night, in that Australian tent in the province of 
for a day i was filled with desire and i watched online film desiring my wife mostly her i think but at times too briefly desiring one of these long haired women who took such pleasure in the passing farmer the seller on the town the delivery man even the elderly and rather small doctor three more times i looked at thap the first time his head was still bowed the second time he was to my surprise looking at the screen he was watching as the camera settled on the face of a dark haired woman who was being made love to in the only way i had ever known to do it and for a time all we could see was her face turned a little to the side jarred again and again her eyes closed but on her face was a smile quite full of love but a little sad like she knew her man would soon have to leave her i know i was reading this into my, uh, into her from my own life she was a swedish prostitute making a pornographic movie and the smile was nothing of this sort it was fake and i know that it's the same with all the smiles in the magazines the smiles of those these naked women are the smiles of money or fame or a hope to break into movies or buy some cocaine or whatever but on that night in the australian tent tha pen i looked at this woman's face and i know what i felt and something told me that tha was feeling that too he watched for a long time his face lifted his hands i know yearning he was still watching as i turned my own face back to the screen there were two more films after that and i viewed them carefully but my mind was now on tha i knew that a few rows in front of me he was suffering this man had been my sworn enemy till a week ago the others in this room had been my friends but tha was my countryman in some deeper way and it had nothing to do with his being vietnamese either i knew what was happening inside him he was desiring his wife just as i was desiring mine except on that night i thought i would one day be with my wife again and he was newly dead but if that was all of it i don't think he would have made this impression on me that does not leave these films he saw sucked at his desire brought the feel of his wife to him made his hands rise before him he was a man after all i watched the films till there were no more and i felt bad for the his wanting a woman wanting his wife is being drawn by that very yearning to a vision of her body as ashes now and bits of bone the third time i looked at him his head was bowed again and probably remained bowed it was bowed still when the lights went on and the captain townsend was called to the front of the room and was hailed for his show with wild applause and cheers and as we all sh- shuffled out of the tent i saw thap's face briefly between his two australian mates the two infantry officers who had made him feel like he was really part of the gang thap's face told me that how it would all end his eyes were wildly restless like he'd been on a sapper mission and a flare had just gone off and he suddenly found himself here in the midst of his enemy that night he went to a tent and killed one of those two infantry officers and one no doubt who had insisted on his coming to the club then thap killed himself a bullet in his brain it was lucky for townsend that thap didn't understand the cheers at the end or the captain might have been chosen instead of the infantry officer Thaf's desire for his wife had made him very unhappy but it alone didn't drive him to his final act that was a result of a history lesson Thaf was a true believer and that night he felt that he had suddenly understood the democracies he was trying to believe in he felt that the communists whom he had rightly broken with who had killed his wife and shown him their own fatal flaw nevertheless had been right about all the rest of us the fact that the impurity of the west had touched thar directly had made him feel something strongly for his dead wife had only made things worse he had no choice and as for myself i live my life in the united states of america i work in a bank i have my own apartment with my own furniture and i have saved more money than i expect ever to need if i can keep my job and there's no worry about that it's a big bank and they like me there I can talk to the Vietnamese customers and they think I'm a good worker beyond that. I read the newspapers, I subscribe to several magazines and in one of them beautiful women smile at me each month. I no longer think of my wife. I go to the movies, I own a VCR and at last I saw the movie Mary Poppins. The street I live on is one of the four named named after Mary Poppins 
in our neighborhood this is true you can look it up on any street map the vietnamese on the west bank do not like the vietnamese in versailles the ones on the west bank point out that for the ones in versailles freedom only means the freedom to make money they are poor people driving people northerners the southerners said that for them freedom means the freedom to think to enjoy life the vietnamese in versailles do not like the southerners we are lazy people to them unfocused greedy but not capable of working hard together for what we want they say that they are the ones who understand who understand america and how to succeed here there are many on the west bank and in versailles who are full of hatred i say that desire can lead to unhappiness and so can a strong belief i can sit for long hours on the late afternoon and into the darkness of night and i do not feel compelled to watch anything or hear anything or do it i can think about sap and i can fold my hands together and at those times there's no hatred at all within me